We are going to be in 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Uh, we could keep going through 1 John 4 to consider this great theme, the love of God, as revealed through Christ and what Christ has done. But, you know, I'm long-winded as it is, so I decided just these verses will do. And I wanted to uh, preach on something that would really complement and reinforce what we've been hearing from our brother, Pastor Bud, through the Life of Christ series, when he asked me to, to cover for him because of Debbie's health and his health. Uh, I immediately knew it had to be something on the cross. I mean, it always ought to lead back to the cross in some way or another. But I wanted to take one of the apostles' commentaries on what the cross means in our daily lives as Christians. One of those passages, and there are many through the letters from the apostles. And I wanted us to consider that together this morning. And 1 John 4, 7 through 11 is, is one such passage. John takes the cross, he, he looks at Jesus being our sacrifice for sin, our propitiation for our sins. I'll explain that term later if you're not familiar with that term. He takes that truth about Jesus and he shows how that's supposed to impact how we live day by day how we relate toward one another. And if there was any one word, as you heard that passage read by Brother Elias, any one word that would stick out in your mind, what was that word? Love. Yes, love. The cross informs us of many different ways we are to live, but love is chief among them. And this passage really shows that. This word for love used here, agape in the Greek, it's used in, in some form of another 13 times in five verses. So, so that's double the amount of verses, more than double, more than 10. 13 times in five verses. And again, you keep going through 1 John 4, he uses it even more. And whenever we see a repeated word in a, in a passage that ought to tip you off, you have a big idea here. You have a theme, very likely what the author, what God using this human author is driving at. And love is a major theme in this passage. John begins this section, verse 7. He's calling his readers beloved, the ones who are dearly loved. That's another form of this word agape. And then he gives a command to the loved ones that we, that they... Christians are to love one another. That's the command. That's the imperative. Let us love one another. You kind of lose some of the force. It's, it's a good way to translate it, but, it, but it's a command. It's not saying, you know, I'll let you do that. I mean, obviously we ought to know if we know ourselves even a little bit. We need to be commanded to love. It doesn't come very natural to us. So this is a command. And if this was all we had, if this was all that you heard you must love one another. That's what John said. That's what, from this pulpit, you're being told. There wouldn't be a very unique message. Many people today, many people throughout generations, many unbelievers, people who don't have any doings with Christ, they don't trust in Christ. It could be a Muslim, it could be a Buddhist, it could be an atheist. They generally agree we should love one another. That, that's a general statement that everyone accepts and yet that's usually where the discussion stops we should love one another yes that's good but you ask how or why you know, what what is love you even ask that question and you're gonna get a, a flood of different answers to that contradicting ones ones that generally are very empty there really is nothing to them. It's like a mist, and, and it looks like something, and yet you could put your hand right through it. There's nothing there. It's vain. It's empty. That's the kind of definitions you'll get, I contend, outside the Bible. But we go to the Word of God, and we don't get empty answers. 
We can learn why to love and how to love and what love actually is. How we're to show that toward one another. And this is the point of not just this passage, 1 John 4, 7 through 11, but many passages, the whole, the whole counsel of God ultimately. This is the reason that we are to love one another. It is because God loves us and he demonstrated his love for us at the cross. It's really that simple. It's the fact of who God is. That's why we are to love one another based off who he is and based off what he has done, especially at the cross, his person, his works. If you're a Christian and you're, you're learning about how to understand who God is, how to live with him, you ought to understand that. Everything goes back to who he is and what he's done. Who he is and what he's said, what he's promised. That, that's, that's the substance of our life. That's how everything holds together for us. We need to know who God is and what has he done, what will he do, his works. What does he promise to do? And that's what we see going on here. God here is revealed as the source of love. Verse 7 says, love comes from God. And then John goes even further at the end of verse 8, as you'll see. And he says, love doesn't only come from God. God is love. So he's not only the source that gives love, but he is the very definition of love. He epitomizes love. What he has worked by sending his son Jesus to die that we might live, to suffer for our sins so that we might find forgiveness with God, peace with him. This is the evidence of his love, the greatest demonstration of it, the proof of his love. That is his works that he points to. And this is why we are to love one another according to this passage. This love is based on unchanging truths about the character of God and the cross of Christ. Something outside of ourselves altogether. If you and I were not born, it, it would be irrelevant. Uh, we would not change. Sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. It would not be irrelevant. We are irrelevant. We had the subject and object order mixed up there. <laughs> we do not change who God is and what he has done in demonstrating his love. Whether we're alive or we're dead, whether we ever existed or not, his love would be proven. It's not something based off of us. And so where does this leave other reasons to love one another? What other reasons can we appeal to ultimately as, as the greatest reason? There are no greater reasons. As Christians who understand the gospel, we have no excuse to not love one another. I'm not to love you because you treat me nice. And I'm not to stop loving you if you don't treat me nice. That's not the basis of why I love you, why I'm to love you. And you're not to love me because things are going well for you today. You feel happy on the inside. You feel healthy on the outside. It's been a good morning. That's not why you're to love me. And even if you're feeling really rotten on the inside, really crummy, really dark and cold, which Christians can feel, and you're feeling, you're breaking down on the outside. You're just falling apart on the outside. You have a headache, you're in chronic pain, whatever it might be. That is no excuse to not love me or not love one another either. That's not the basis of our love for one another. We're not to love one another mainly because we have common interests. We like to do the same things. It's not the main reason we love one another. We're not to love one another because we've proven that we can trust one another. Does that help? Does that, that, does that cultivate, make it, make it easier to love one another? Yes, it does. But that's really not the reason. It's not the ground for why we are to love one another. And we're not to love one another because we can relate with one another so well. This, this person listens to me and can relate with me. And, and I feel heard by this person. Or I, I feel a connection. 
That is very good. That's not to be despised. We want to cultivate that with one another. But that really is not the basis, the grounds for which we love one another. The scripture gives us no reason to see that. The reason you and I should be loving one another is because God loves us and he demonstrated his love at the cross. 1 John 4, 7 through 11, it's not the only passage to teach this. I'll fly through a few. Our Lord Jesus says this in John 15, 12 and 13. He said to his apostles, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So John is saying nothing new. The Apostle John, as he writes this letter to the churches, decades after Jesus said those words in the upper room, John was taught by the Lord Jesus, and he's echoing what Jesus had said from the beginning. Paul, Ephesians 4.32, he says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And he's pointing back to who God is and what he's done. And he relates that to the day-by-day relationships Christians are to have with one another. Marked by kindness, tender-heartedness. Your heart is open to this other person, not closed and, and hard and cold. And you are ready, eager, willing to forgive because of what God in Christ has done for you and forgiving you. And I I could go on. Many other examples. You can even go to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. And this was laid out in the book of Leviticus, tucked away there in the middle, centrally. Leviticus 19, verse 18. The Lord said through Moses, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is where Jesus drew the second great commandment, Matthew 22. He quotes Leviticus 19.18 about loving your neighbor as yourself. And God simply says at the end, I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. Why do you do this? I am the Lord. (laughs) It's because who I am and you are my people. That is why. It goes back to something outside of ourselves altogether. Leviticus 19.34, a few verses later. He says, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For because you were strangers in the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. So again, he's pointing back to himself, and he's reminding Israel where they came from. You know, they were no longer in Egypt, slaves under Pharaoh, slaves under all those burdens. Well, why not? Who changed that? Did God do something? Did God work salvation for them? He did. He brought them out of Egypt. So it goes back to his person, his works. That's the basis by which the Israelites were to love even strangers. To show that kind of hospitality. And so love was not to be driven by feelings. Love is not to be driven by anything in us ultimately. It's driven by who God is and what he has done. And so 1 John 4, 7 through 11, it gives several of such reasons why and how Christians are to love one another. And it really centers on God sending his son. It centers on the cross. That's, that's the, uh, the center, the heart of this passage. But we'll start at the top and we'll look right at the bottom. Verse 7, verse 11. Hopefully you can remember that. It's kind of a catchy title. If I wanted to be kind of cheesy, I could make some sermon title out of that, but I'm, uh, we don't do that around here. So, <laughs> so verse 7, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, you know, All day, all day loving one another. <laughs> okay, I better stop now. So verse 7 opens up with an imperative to be loving one another. And verse 11 is bookended. You read that there, verse 11. Uh, beloved, again, he says beloved again, just like at verse 7, uses that title again. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So he goes right back to what he says in verse 7. Not, not an imperative, 
Though that word ought, there's, there's strength to that ought. Uh, really, in the Greek, it, it literally means we are obligated. We are under obligation to love one another. That, that's how you could translate that. And so that bookends this passage. He starts with the command. He ends with a sense of obligation, again, appealing to them as loved ones. They themselves loved by God, loved by Him. Love is all through this passage. But then through verses 8 and 10, kind of the meat in this sandwich, so to speak, you have these reasons, reasons to love one another. So let's read that together. I'll read, I'll read the whole thing here. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. So starting in verse 7, halfway through 7 actually. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So verse 7, where you see that for, in the middle of verse 7, for love is from God, he's stating a reason. Because, do this because love is from God. Same word as is translated because at the end of verse 8. You have for, you have because, two reasons. Verse 9 now, he says, in this the love of God was made manifest among us. That... Or you could translate that because, same word, same word as the first two I was focused on, for and because, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And then notice he repeats this in this statement again. Verse 10, in this is love, not that or not because we have loved God, but that, but because he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So for, because, that. It's the same Greek word, hati. It's the same word being used there. That shows there's, there's a reason being given. So it's all throughout from halfway through verse 7 up to through verse 10. So these reasons are very important. Because in verse 11, John finishes by saying, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And that word so, verse 11, he's not talking about God loved us so, 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 so much. Like, like it was this big. It's not what he's saying there. It's not what that, that's the sense of that word is. It is, for God loved us in this way. Like so. Now, we don't really use that expression anymore, right? How, how do you, how, how does my voice project? Like so. You know, I, I, could, I could say that. It kind of sounds too formal, but, but that's the idea here. In this manner, God loved us. So what he's saying in verse 11 is, therefore, we should love one another. So how did God love us? What are the reasons? Well, that's really the basis of of loving one another. If we're going to love one another, we need to understand what God has done for us and who he is. These reasons John gives. So verse 7 and 8, he gives reasons to love based on who God is as the source of love. So the emphasis on who God is. Who is he? And then verse 9 and 10, he gives reasons to love based on the love Seen by what he has done, again, his works, sending his son that we might live through him, sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So looking at here, first, the nature of who God is as the reason we are to love. You, you see in verse 7, love comes from God. Love is from God. John says there. So he starts. And then he talks about whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So again, I think of it like sandwiches. John sandwiches things. He kind of circles back. It really seems simple the way John writes. And yet there's a depth to it. It's so simple you could kind of fly past it sometimes. 
and, and you're missing the beauty, the depth of how John writes. But notice what he's doing here. He's, he's making first in verse 7, love as the subject. Here is love and it comes from God. But then by the end of verse 8, he's saying God is love. God is the subject now. So it's not just that, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but, but God doesn't just give out this thing called love that's separate from him. Yes, he produces love, but, but he is love. It comes from him because he is love. So it's interesting how John is, is doing this. He starts with what you'd kind of observe as love, and he traces it right back to the source. And in between these two subjects, love and God, there's a contrast between the one who loves and the one who does not love. So here's the first principle, the first truth we ought to understand here, and its application. God overflows with love because it is his very nature to love. And we must be and know before we can do. We can focus a lot on doing, especially this command to, to love one another. And you think, okay, I got I to gotta get doing this. But that's not where John starts. John starts back to being who God is. And who are those who are born of him and know him? So starting with God, love is the very being of God. It's an attribute of God. It's one of his characteristics. And it encompasses like any attribute of God. It's not one part and he's made up of many different parts. He is all loving. He is always loving. He is completely loving. He is lovingly patient. He is lovingly kind. Even in his justice, he is motivated by love. Even in his wrath, he is motivated by love. And this love is eternal. It never had a beginning and it won't have an end. It is unchanging and it is freely given. Like a fountain continually would bring out water. So God is, is the source of love. And he needs no creature. He needs no outside thing to actually motivate him to love. Everything he does in love, everything he needs to love, if I could put it that way, he doesn't have a need, but, but he freely loves. There's nothing that, that compels him or he looks upon one or the other and says, you are so nice, you are so good, that I, I will love you. It comes and starts, it, it ultimately returns back to him because he is love. Now his wrath, his anger, that is drawn out by something external to himself. There was a time when God had no need to be angry. There was no one to be angry at. There was no sin, there was no sinner to be wrathful against. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were in perfect fellowship, loving one another. When they created the angels, and no angels had fallen, no rebellion had took place, he, who was he to be angry at? There was no need to be angry. But there was many creatures to love. There was the Godhead, the persons of the Trinity, to eternally be loving. When Adam and Eve were created, he loved them. He, there was no need to judge them, to be wrathful against them, until sin entered the world. It's something that should not be. It's against God's very nature. It's why he cannot lie. Some people try to say God can do anything. No, he can't. No, the scripture says he can't lie. He can't tempt you, right? So you have to qualify these things. Can God make a mountain so big he can't move it? Uh, you know, these are just silly questions. God does everything consistent with his nature. And his nature is to love. And so even when there's sin needing to be addressed, love ultimately motivates him. But, but love is the very, the very core of who he is, if I could put it that way. It, there, there's, no, there's no object that had drawn it out of him. He always, always has been loving. And just as God is known for his love, so must his children be known for love. That's what's being 
talked about here. That's the logic John is using. If the Father, if God the Father is so marked by love, then those who are born of the Father, those who know the Father, they also should be marked by love. That's, that's the relationship here. This is what John says in verse 7. Love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. The evidence of being born of God and knowing Him is by one's loving. Like father, like son. Like father, like daughter. Use that proverb. So we need to define what does this mean? What does it mean to be born of God and to know God? John's putting a lot of emphasis here on this. Well, born, it's, it's in something called the, the perfect tense, meaning it happened at some time in the past, but its effects are ongoing. So it's not that this person is, is continually being born. No, no, this happened. But the fact that this one is born, this person who loves has been born, it really makes a difference now to what John's talking about here. There's an ongoing effect to this. Spiritual birth is different than physical birth. To be spiritually born does not come with physical birth. I mean, if you look at verse 9, the end of verse 9 here in John 4, 1 John 4, I mean, why did Jesus get sent by God? So that we might do what through Him? To, to live through Him. It implies that, that we weren't living before. There was, there was something wrong with our lives that wasn't true life according to God. You have a heartbeat and you have lots of electricity in your brain and you can walk and you can talk. But God doesn't call that life, ultimately. He has something far deeper, far greater, when He speaks of life. Not mere existence, but, but true life. Genesis 3 records how sin brought death. From dust to dust, the body made of dust goes back to the dust. But there was also spiritual death that took place. Adam and Eve were no longer allowed to be in the presence of God. The source of life they were cut off from. They were, as death really means in its core idea, separated. Separated from not just the soul from the body, which is what we often think of when we think of death, but the soul from God, its source of life. Sin does that. It causes a separation between us and our God, as Isaiah says. And this is what happened when sin came into the world and we are all born in Adam's sin. We're all born by nature, separated from God. There's no spiritual life that we are born with. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, Paul says that we were dead. Christians were at one time dead in our trespasses and sins in, once, in which we once walked. And those who are not yet Christians, not yet born of God, as John is saying here, they remain spiritually dead. And Scripture demonstrates that we need this kind of radical change from within. God can give us all the rules, all the commandments, His whole heart, His whole expectation for us to live by, and we will not follow it. We cannot because we will not. Because of that spiritual deadness, we have a craving for sin. We have a craving for the things that God detests. It is so opposite. And that is what we are naturally born with. And that's the history of the Bible. You know, God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel, and how did they do upholding them? They failed miserably. God gives them a king. And another king and another king to guide them and rule them. The kings become corrupted. The priests become corrupted. The prophets become corrupted. The history of the Old Testament is one big history of how God needs to change us. We can't follow him ourselves. And so this life that God gives, it is from him. It is a work that he does. John 1, 12 to 13. 
says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This new birth, being born again, is accompanied by faith in Jesus Christ. Now we want to argue what precedes what, regeneration, being born again, you know, resulting in faith or faith, resulting in regeneration. Uh, we could talk about that after. <laughs> That's one of those hairs that, that theologians want to split, I think. I, there's, there's verses that seem to point that I would be comfortable to say faith accompanies being born again and both come from God ultimately. That this is something that God does. He opens our hearts. He draws us so that we choose him. But this is something that comes from him. He is the father bringing life, bringing birth. It's not something that we do or we earn. So in a sinful world, we need this. We need this new life within us. And to be born again, to trust in Christ and have that new heart from him, it leads to us knowing him. That's what, that's what else John emphasizes here. Those love who have been born of God and know God. And this isn't something like in the birth. It's in the perfect tense. Something that happened in the past and it has an ongoing effect. People can talk about that. I, I began to know God. You could say it like that, but, but John doesn't say it like that. It's the present tense, meaning this is something happening right as he's write, writing. It's an ongoing thing focused on what is happening right now. It may have begun when you were born. That's what's implied here. But there's an ongoing knowing. Not just knowing about, but a personal relationship. An intimacy. A friendliness with God. You have been brought into his family through the new birth. Through faith in Jesus Christ. And now you get to know him. Now you get to relate with him, walk with him, share concerns with him, and know his heart. There's a relationship there. That's what is being spoken of here. And so the new birth and this relationship with God are necessary to love as God loves. John starts there. John assumes such love will begin coming natural. Really supernatural, but it, but it starts to be something that God works within a person to love. And this is a mark of every Christian. There's a desire to love others, especially other Christians, which the born-again person simply can't shut off. It, it's, it's a valve that you can't just completely turn off. There'll be a pressure building within you to extend love, to extend kindness to help. That's what John's assuming here. You notice what he says in verse 8. He assumes this so much that in verse 8 he says, Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And, and John, in very black and white statements, you know, it startles us. You think, okay, what, you know, does that mean on a bad day when I'm not loving, I have to question my whole salvation? I have to question everything about who I am as, as somebody who's trusted in Christ. Not necessarily. John here is speaking against false teachers who he is concerned about. Throughout this letter, you know, we're jumping in here at 1 John 4. But throughout the whole letter, he's making these comparisons. You know, these people say they know God, but they also say they have no sin. 1 John 1. Uh, these people, you know, showing these opposites. There was clearly false teachers, false Christians, who were coming in to those John was writing to, saying they were Christians, but not actually being Christians. Teaching a different doctrine, living in a very different way. And it's likely that these were people who emphasized having enough secret knowledge, enough enough wisdom in, in some kind of secret sense of it, what would later be called Gnosticism. 
This was an early form of Gnosticism invading these Christian churches. And these would be people saying, you know, I, I know the secret words that get me to heaven. I know things that you don't know. And yet, when you look at their life, wow, they, they live like the devil. Um, and, and they would say, well, but I know things you don't know. <laughs> That's how I know I'm going to heaven. Uh, it's like some of these false teachers today. They could be caught up in so many different scandals. And yet, because they have some kind of power from God or something you don't have, they can strut around thinking that they're okay. And they actually deceive people. Also thinking they're okay. But the context is key. You know, 1 John 2, 27. John there says, You have no need anyone teach you because you have the anointing. You, you have the Holy Spirit, he's saying. And if you just dropped in on that verse, you know, John's saying, You have no need anyone teach you. And, and that was the verse, you know, I, I preached a message just on that verse. Forget about what else is going on in the letter. Uh, yeah, you can see why. That just doesn't make sense with the rest of Scripture. Right? Scripture's never... You can't just grab a verse and, and go with it, run with it. But, but these people were saying, you need me to teach you. I have secret wisdom that you don't have. And so you better come to, to, and listen to what I'm saying. And, and John's saying, Christianity doesn't work like that. These, these leaders are not that important. Uh, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the Word of God. You have one another, but there's not the secret wisdom that some only some have, and, and you need to go to these people. So what John is emphasizing here, if someone doesn't demonstrate a pattern in their life of loving, they're not marked by this kind of love that, that, that they're eager to do, that, that is characteristic of them, if they're not actively loving other people, then it is safe to assume they don't know God, who is love. They're not in the presence of God, being impacted by Him, being changed by Him. Uh, one preacher has this illustration. This isn't original to me. But it's a good illustration, so I'll use it. And he, he puts it forward to the congregation. He says, imagine if I stood up here, as I am, and I told you that on my way here, my, my, I needed to pull over because a, a tire was flat and I was changing a tire. And a semi-truck just, just piled into me. And it squished me flat as a pancake. And that's what happened before I came here. Right, you would question, did that truck really impact you in that way? <laughs> Do you know what a semi-truck does? Right? I mean, I'm looking at you. Have you really met with this semi-truck? Have you went head on? Have you had that kind of relationship to a truck like that? I think that's what the point is here. Somebody says, I know God. I've, I've been born from him. I believed in him. I've, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've trusted in Jesus. And yet there's no evidence to show that they've really met God. They don't love. And that's one of the main evidences that John's going to repeat again and again and again. Just like it's in the nature of a semi-truck to destroy me, it's how big it is and how destructive that would be hitting me. If God is love, then, then you yourself, if you know him, you will begin to love. You will begin to be marked by love. You will be changed and impacted in a way fitting to what is impacting you. Who is impacting you? John Calvin says this quote, he says, For when anyone separates faith from love, it is the same as though he attempted to take away heat from the sun. You, you can't do that ultimately. Uh, the sun creates heat just in the nature of the sun to do that. I understand you can have clouds and have a day like earlier today. That's not the point, right? Uh, you know, go above. Look at the sun as the sun is, and it's creating heat. And that is the nature of, of trusting in God. There will be love that comes from that. Even if it's in seed form in the beginning, like one born of God, one born physically, you have baby steps, right? My son is crying. I'm thankful adults are not doing that, right? Like that would be weird, right? But we expect that from a one-year-old. I don't expect that from adults. So it has to start somewhere, right? But it's real. There's, there, you know, you hear the lungs of my boy. It's genuine life. There's life there. 
Spiritually, it's the same, and love is the mark of that. Loving one another really is. So, those who have been born of God and know Him must love one another because God is love, and God gives love. Are you born again, and are you knowing God? And does your love evidence it? Your kindness, your patience, your desire to help. We're going to go into some of the characteristics of love as seen by God in his works. If you've trusted in Christ, if you've realized what he's done for you, and dying for your sins, and rising again to give you life eternal, then there will be something in you compelling you to love. And if you're here today, and, and this is disturbing you, you feel that, that constant coldness, it's hard to forgive others, it's hard to even get around others. Maybe you dragged yourself here this morning after dragging yourself here for a while. I'm not just talking about a bad day, but, but this is something deep in you. Then, then, then talk with me after the service. Talk with one of the elders. Talk with a mature Christian here who can help you understand you know, how you can really be born again. Or at least bring you to a place of assurance if, if God has left you here to seek him afresh. Whatever spiritual state you're in, but, but don't walk out of here letting his word fall to the ground. Secondly here, we see that God is love and he defines love. Therefore, we must believe love according to the Bible and reject any definitions of love that do not fit the biblical definition. And I have to speed through this, but God is love. So, the, the, what we naturally think is, here's love, and this is my idea of love, and, and here's God. Many of us hear about love before we hear about God. So we go through the world thinking of, of God and love kind of separate. There are some who want to say today, love is love. Maybe you've heard this phrase before. Uh, those who are promoting homosexuality, transgenderism, all these kinds of aberrations, these sins, they, they parrot this around. Love is love. And what they're emphasizing is love as a feeling or a force or a way of getting what I want, ultimately. Uh, whether I, I have that toward a man or a woman, and you know it's, it's turning into a child, an animal, whether I have it towards a video game character or you know people of married pillows and married cars and you know, the, the bizarre things. But, but that feeling is as legitimate as, as any other feeling, as many of you heterosexual couples right now. It's this focus on this feeling. Again, not outside the person, but all inside the person. And this focus on self, I mean, it, it's, it's the very opposite of biblical love, as we're going to see. Because, because God's love gives. It is selfless. And this is all about consumption. This is all about the person and how they feel and what they want. So love is love. It's a very empty and, and, and really dangerous concept. Because where is the boundaries to this feeling? Right? I mean, the brakes have been destroyed. And we're plunging into the absurdity of this. Several decades ago, people laughed at Christians saying, you know, as you open up homosexuality saying it's legitimate, now you're going to open up other kinds of things. You know, adults loving children and so forth. And people laughed at Christians. Uh, but that is a real thing. You could go online and look at this TED talk by some, I can't remember, it was a German woman, I can't remember her name. But she is openly on this TED talk, justifying pedophilia. And, and that's coming out more and more, justifying incest, justifying bestiality. Uh, that is, in the academic world, that is an open discussion now. And that's usually where it starts, and then it'll trickle in through Oprah and through CNN and, you know. But it's, it's, it's really going on there. And where, where's it going to end? Uh, you know, we're going back to the times in Rome. God gets to define love. He puts the boundaries on it. He, he knows what's best. We are his products. He's the manufacturer. We can trust him with that. And it comes from him, not, not something that we just feel. That's so dangerously deceptive, as if we could trust our feelings, as if we'd learn. Uh, it comes from him, not within us. 
This is the, you know, everyone kind of groans at me giving these examples and we roll our eyes thinking, oh yeah, these worldly people, what are they thinking? This one strikes a little closer to home though among Christians. When we say, not God is love, but love is God. When we reverse the order of that. And this is where we get into the danger of saying, here's my idea of love. And here's God and what I'm understanding about God. And I'm going to judge God based off what I think is loving. So when I read about a flood, when I read about the destruction of Canaanites, man, woman, child, animal, when I read about the cross, this word propitiation, to suffer, wrath, you know, as Christians today saying, no, God wouldn't do that to his son. That's, that's as one person put it, cosmic child abuse. That would not be loving. That's what they say. That would not be loving. And you can get where they're coming from in a certain sense. Though it's not right, it's not biblical, but they're starting over here. They're saying, I have this idea of love, and I'm going to read the Bible and judge the Bible. Judge God. I'll sit in judgment over God based off of what I know of love. Because now you're elevating your idea of love to be God, rather than starting with God. Start with God. Start with the source. Start with the authority. The one who was from the beginning. That's where we need to start. He is love. He gets to define love because it's from him. We owe our existence to him. He, he's literally created everything. He holds everything together. He gets to say what love is. And he doesn't say on Monday love is this, on a Wednesday love is that. You know, that's what we're doing today in our world. And this generation, if the Lord tarries, will look back another generation and say, oh, they were bigots. I'll close minded. Let's destroy their statues. Let's destroy their rainbow flags because there'll be something else, right? It's just, it, the world is passing away in its desires. First John 2. God is unchanging. He's our rock. We can trust him. He's the source. And so we need to make sure we believe that. When we do read hard things in the Bible, we don't fly off the handle saying, well, this just cannot be because, because that doesn't fit what I expect God to do. Who, who's God? Who is God again? Is it, is it me? Is it you? God is God. We need to let God be God. And so we need our minds renewed about God's love. As, as we've trusted in him, we're born again. As we know him, we, we have this relationship with him. He will renew our minds about love. We will begin to appreciate that while, while God is merciful, He is just. He is wrathful. And it's a good thing He is. Because sin is so horrible. And we're so used to sin. We're born in it. We've drunk it. You know, it, it's, it's, it's something that maybe certain sins that disturb us more than others, of course. But, but this is God. God who knows no sin, whose eyes are purer than to behold evil. As Habakkuk says, and even one blemish on this whiteness of his purity, it is something abominable to him because he's so good. It's his goodness that compels him to hate sin, to hate the sinner, as the Psalms say, to love the sinner. He still loves. He can't help but love. But sin has aroused his anger and out of a love for what is good, he must hate evil. Again, if I told you that I love babies, but I also love abortion, you ought to see a contradiction in that, right? I hate abortion because I love babies. So, so hate is not the opposite of love. Uh, they come from God. You got to be careful with that, of course. But to oppose something, before you edit the sermon and make, you know, run that wild, yeah, I could go hate people, sure. No, I'm not saying that. Opposing something, this, this, this righteous... Anger, saying this is not right, I will oppose this. That it can come from a place of love. And we ought to cultivate that as we look at the love of God. I believe I, I ought to stop there. I'm looking at the time. <laughs> Verses 9 and 10, let me give you a flyover of that. These are the works of God. We'll have to return to these. But... Even as we talk about these hard things, 
God is loving as we see this world full of war, full of pain, full of hurt. God is loving when he did judge the Canaanites and had the Israelites come in and slaughter them. You know, that's easy for a preacher to say, but, but you really have to let that sink in. You really need to wrestle with that. As you go through things in your own lives and your circumstances seem to be the opposite of what you expect a loving God to give you, you're going to be forced. You're going to be put in positions to say, do I believe God is love or do I not believe that? And none of, none of the Christians here would likely open up their mouth and say, no, I'm not believing that today. But the Lord knows our hearts. When, when we grumble, when we complain, when we try to sin our way into what we want, rather than waiting upon God and trusting what He's doing in our lives, these are all signs that we're actually not resting in His love. We're not believing that He actually has the best for us as his children, as those who've trusted in Christ. Now, if you're here and you've not yet trusted in Christ, that, that consolation can't be yours. That comfort can't be the same. Uh, will he put things in your way to get you to a place where you trust in him? Yes, I pray he does. I pray he doesn't let you live thinking everything's okay. As if you have this, this terminal cancer within you, but you feel great. Why go see the doctor, and yet here's this cancer getting worse and worse in you? If you are not yet born again, if you've not yet trusted in Christ, uh, then you need to do that. Otherwise, this love, this love that God has, it will mean He will have to judge you. He will have to put you into the lake of fire, ultimately, where justice is being met against sinners who deserve it. Sinners like myself who deserve it. If left to myself, I would still be on my way there. But a loving judge doesn't just let criminals go. You know, we are seeing this today in our city, aren't we? I mean, we are seeing lawless people. You know, Brother Elias can testify, some of the men, the men here from Hope Mission can testify of this. Uh, we just had somebody last week, I guess they stole a pickup truck and head on to was it like six cars on the yellow head or, and, and whatnot. This lawlessness, this disorder, it, it begins when love doesn't motivate us to hold people accountable. When a society thinks love is this kind of compassion that doesn't stand for what's right, not true compassion. God is not like that. God loves us enough to punish sin and to punish sinners. He loves his creation enough to say there needs to be something done to uphold what is right. And so you, you're going to praise him in one sense or submit to him, recognizing his justice and yet being cast into the lake of fire even still. Or even today, you can humble yourself and you can trust in him. You can give yourself to him and ask for forgiveness through Jesus Christ, who came so you might live, who paid your sins so that you might be forgiven. God demonstrated that love toward you so that you don't need to suffer his justice. And you can praise him as the God of love, as your father, not as your judge. That's what we appeal to every person here but for us who are in Christ, day by day, we need to understand the love of God as revealed in the cross. When you look at your circumstances, you can't think about God based off what's happening in your life. You lose a family member. You lose a job. You lose your health. God takes these things away from you. You're going to be tempted to, to clutch your fist at God. And yet you can always remember the cross. What did he do at the cross? What was lost at the cross? What did Jesus give up for a time so that you might have forgiveness, so that you might live? Again, John, he points to the cross here as that ultimate proof of God's love. You can look at what God does and, and other things that he said, but the cross is that ultimate expression 
where you would least expect it, which is the irony of it, the, the amazing wisdom of God. There Jesus hung naked, bruised and beaten, and, and everyone around him thought he was cursed. Everyone around him thought God hated him. And yet there God's love was displayed. Because Jesus did what we deserve. We deserve that kind of punishment. And yet Jesus voluntarily took it. So that we could have peace with God. And so every time, even in my own life, I'm tempted to doubt God, I look back to the cross. It's outside of myself. It's not a feeling. It's not some kind of thought. It doesn't change. It's done. He's proven it. And what more must I ask for God to do than to send his own son for me? And there's great comfort that comes from that. So, so brethren, believe that God is love. Look to the cross and be comforted. Let that, let that apply in every area of your life and lead to a contentment that the world simply cannot have. Let's pray. O oh, Father in heaven, I preach these things and yet I, I don't practice them as I should. I confess to you, I, I don't love my brethren through this kind of love as I should. I don't love you as I should. And Lord, I pray that you would humble us. You would help us see our great need to focus on your love. O oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to love one another, not as mere duty, not as a command to do, not because I said so or any expectation from others ultimately. Help us do this because you are love. Love comes from you. And we have been born of you. There ought to be a fire in our hearts that wants to do good toward one another. And Lord, I understand that fire can cool and those embers can grow colder. But oh God, we pray you'd fan in the flame of those desires, those new affections you've given us as Christians. And afresh, we would present ourselves to you ready to love one another, ready to imitate you and follow you as our Heavenly Father because of all what you've proven of your love. And, O oh, Father, for those here who are not yet born again, we pray that, that they would see your love, they would be moved to trust in you, there would be no excuse that they would hold on to that would keep them from receiving your love. And, uh, Lord, they would say with John, it's not because they have loved you, but because you've loved them. O oh Lord, if you were to leave us with our pitiful love, we would have no place to stand before you. But thank you that your love is so freely given. And we praise you for this love in Jesus' name. Amen.